Welcome everyone, my name is Catherine Hay and I work for the International Development Research Center here uh, based in Delhi at our regional office for South Asia and China, soon to be our regional office for all of Asia. Um, it's so nice to be here sitting amongst um, several friends and some new faces as well. Um, if I think back to eight or nine years ago when a few of us were trying to spur interest in Delhi in sort of lectures, seminars, discussions on evaluation theory and practice, there was a lot of um, curiosity but also a lot of blank looks. And so I see here in the room um, many of the organizations that were sort of first to get on board and to be interested in the role that evaluation can play in um, the sort of four legs of, of research, evaluation, um, policy, and programming. And so you, we know that we need to have all of those things to be actually figuring out what brings about change, what kind of changes are we looking for, what shows promise, what's working on the ground. And so to see over these years sort of how different players have um, begun to shape this field and to see the sort of energy and interest um, in the Delhi community um, to, to come and talk and explore these kinds of issues is just fantastic. And it's so nice to be partnering with, uh, with the Clear J. Paul Center on these lectures and to just see the numbers growing each time. So do make sure you've given your details because um, there will be other talks and lectures and we'd certainly love to have all of you there. So I'm going to stop there because you've got a really rich, rich set of um, speakers ahead of you. And I'm just going to um, welcome you again on behalf of IDRC and pass the mic to John, who's going to say a few words of welcome and introduction uh, on behalf of CLEAR. Hello, everyone. Uh, on behalf of j South Asia at IFMR and CLEAR, I'd like to join Catherine and welcome you to the event. Uh, one of our goals in CLEAR is to work with partners like IDRC, um, the community of evaluators, many of the organizations in this room, uh, not only to try to build demand and interest in evaluation, uh, not only to play some role in helping to improve the quality and the supply of evaluation, but also to find regular events to bring people from the evaluation community together here um, to discuss the role of evaluation and development. Um, so that's what we discussed with Catherine a few months ago to start this regular roundtable series. Um, the first one we had was on te uh, technical innovations in monitoring and evaluation. This one, we're very happy to be on theories of change. And we'll probably be going through uh, the monitoring and evaluation kind of data collection process uh, in the future. So looking at designing instruments, both quantitative and qualitative, uh, but issues around data collection, data analysis. So uh, without this uh, presentation, we're very, very thankful to have an esteemed group of presenters. So just very quickly, I'd like to, uh, to introduce each one. Uh, first uh, presenting will be Lindsay uh, from 3IE. And her presentation is on the fundamentals of the theory of change. Uh, then we'll be, we're very lucky to have Vimla with us from the Education Research Unit. And she's going to be looking at a, a particular case study um, around in the, in the education sector. And finally, uh, in closing, will be Priya. And Priya is going to be looking at a specific uh, program in, in government of Haryana uh, running past transfers uh, to, to girls and, and also kind of critiquing the theory of change through that. So uh, please join me in welcoming our guests. And Diva, do you want to begin with the, the, the introduction of, of Lindsay to begin? Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Diva Dhar, and I'm a policy and training manager at Clear South Asia, hosted by j at IFMR. Um, I'll be moderating today's roundtable on the theory of change. Each panelist will make a 20-minute long presentation followed by a round of questions and answers, and I look forward to your active participation. Our first speaker today is Lindsay Novak. Lindsay works as an evaluation officer at the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation, better known as 3IE. As an evaluation officer, she's involved in the review and quality control of impact evaluation funding proposals and their resulting products. 
One aspect of quality control is determining the strength of the theory of change of interventions and assessing how well impact evaluations test those theories. Today, she will present on the fundamentals of the theory of change and explain the concepts, components, and application of the theory of change. Can everybody hear me? Okay, I tend to talk relatively quietly. So is everybody, can you hear me in the back? Okay, great. So I, I'll jump right in since you have a very nicely introduced me. So as, um, as they've said, I'm going to talk about the fundamentals of the theory of change and include a very short example just to give it a little bit more flavor, hopefully. So the first thing that I want to do is talk about terminology. So I think with anything in evaluation, um, the same name can be used for many things and many things can be called the same thing. So the first thing I want to say is um, what I've heard the theory of change be called, which are all of these four things. So the program theory, um, the causal chain, theory-based evaluation, and a logic model. So some of you might think of um, all of these things to mean what I'm about to talk about, and some of you may think of some, some of these things to mean something completely different. But hopefully we'll come to a common understanding. So all of these four things can be used in contrast to what is known as the black box approach. So anytime somebody calls a study a black box study, it is most definitely not a compliment. And um, usually that means that at the very end of the evaluation, the evaluation team is able to say outcomes improved by 25%, but they can't tell you why. And they can't tell you how it could be better. Or they say the program didn't work at all, but they can't tell you why. So that's the, the main question that we're talking about here is answering the why question. So that's the point behind a theory of change and inserting, in, inserting it in to your evaluation methodology. So the first thing um, that I'm going to talk about is I'm starting from the assumption that, that the program is more or less already designed. So some people might think of the theory of change actually starting from a needs assessment and working back to defining a program, but I'm actually starting from the point of an evaluator that's called in and says, play, and the, the implementing agency says, please, will you evaluate this program? So that's the assumption that I'm starting from. So the first question that you should be asking as an evaluator is, what is the program? And not just a few details, a lot of details. You want to know exactly what's happening, what's going to be happening on the ground. The second question that you should be asking is, what outcomes does the program aim to achieve? So how, how are people's lives going to improve as a result of this program, or what is the goal? The third is, what intermediate steps lead to those outcomes? Now, if that's not clear now, hopefully it will be as I talk through an example. And then the fourth is, what assumptions are associated with each link in the chain? So again, if that's not clear, hopefully it will become clear as I talk about um, a particular example. So the example that I'm going to talk about is um, a malaria, a school-based malaria program that happened in Kenya um, that 3I is funding an evaluation of. So they had a really great theory of change already inserted into their program, so I decided to steal it for this presentation because I thought it was quite well done. So um, this program is, again, a school-based malaria intervention. So they went into schools and they did rapid, rapid diagnostic testing to find if the children had malaria parasites in their blood. And if they did have malaria parasites, then they were given a full malaria medication regimen. So if you were the evaluation team, you should be asking many more questions than that, but we'll start from, from that assumption. So we're going to put the malaria intervention on the left-hand side. The second question that you should be asking is what outcomes does the program aim to achieve? So in this particular program, what they wanted to see is that learning outcomes increased. The children were able to learn much, much more because they were healthy, they were in school, so they learned more. That was the, the ultimate goal of this program. So we're going to put that on the right-hand side. So the third question they should be asking is, what intermediate steps lead to those outcomes? So I think we can all agree that if somebody receives a malaria pill, they're not automatically going to do better in school. There's a lot that needs to happen from point A to point B. So we're going to talk about each thing that would need to happen for, the, for this malaria intervention to actually increase educational outcomes. So the first thing that needs to happen is that the malaria intervention actually has to improve health. 
So there should be reduced clinical attacks, and there should be reduced asymptomatic peri- um, malaria parasites in the blood. So that's kind of the first thing that needs to happen is children actually have to get healthier. So the second thing that would need to happen is that the fewer clinical attacks actually lead to increased school attendance. So if children are healthier, then they're actually attending school more. The third is that if there are reduced, that there are fewer malaria parasites in their blood, then there's less anemia. So malaria parasites are a very large cause of, an, cause of, a, of anemia. So that's kind of the assumption. So then reduced anemia should then lead to improved cognition and improved concentration in the children. And all of these three things, increased school attendance, improved cognition, and increased concentration, should then lead to increased knowledge. So this is the idea of the program. If you really lay it out, these are all of the things that have to happen for a malaria intervention to actually increase knowledge. So again, the fourth question that we need to ask is what assumptions are associated with each link? So, yeah, so I think as, as, we talk, as, we, as I talk more through that, hopefully that will become clear. So the, the idea that a malaria intervention actually improves health, there are a lot of associ- assumption, assumptions associated with that. So the first is that students are correctly targeted, and in order for that to happen, the um, rapid diagnostic testing tools actually have to be accurate, and the people that are doing the testing have to know how to read them and correctly categorize people. So that's one thing that that would have to to be in place. Um, The second is that the medicine is actually effective, so hopefully the Kenyan government has selected a medicine that has proven to be effective in clinical trials. The fourth is that children actually adhere to the full medicine regimen. Um, This is a six-pill uh, medication plan, so that's there's a little bit of an assumption behind that, that they actually do take all of the medication. And then fourth is that this is not considered a substitution for preventative measures. So if parents start thinking, oh, my child had all of this, med- this malaria medication, I no longer need to use bed nets, it could actually have a negative effect, possibly. It's an assumption. Um, and these, this is most definitely not an exhaustive list, but for the sake of brevity, I won't talk through all of them. So uh, I'm skipping some of the links, again, for the sake of brevity. But um, So the next thing that I'll talk about is that there's, there are a lot of assumptions that, ha- that need to be in place for reduced clinical attacks to actually increase school attendance. So one of them is that the binding constraint has to be addressed. And by that, I mean that the reason children weren't going to school is because they were sick with malaria. If that's not the case, if the reason they're not going to school is because the schools are too far, the kids are unmotivated, the parents don't think it's important, then the fact that the kids are now healthier and don't have malaria doesn't mean that they're going to be in school. So that's one assumption. The second is that child labor doesn't increase. So if, for example, the parents now think, my child is healthy, he's going to be much more productive if I put him out in the field instead of going to school, then school attendance will not increase. So, and then lastly, there is um, an assumption that increased school attendance, improved cognition, and increased concentration actually lead to increased knowledge. And in order for that to happen, the schools have to be functioning sufficiently well. It's not that they have to be amazing, but they have to, knowledge has to be transmitted in order for um, healthy, healthy and concentrated kids to actually learn more. So there's some assumptions. So outcomes and assumptions can be tested in a number of ways. And some of them can be tested with a counterfactual analysis. And I think fully explaining that could um, is kind of outside of the realm of this particular talk. But, but the idea is that you have people that actually received the program. So you have individuals that received the malaria medication. And you have individuals that did not receive the malaria medication but are similar in every other way. So you're, you're basically comparing those children that did receive the program to those that didn't but are similar to determine if the program was effective. So some... Some of these things can be tested with a counterfactual analysis. So, for example, reduced clinical attacks, that can be tested. So you can actually count the number of people that had malaria attacks in the program group and the number of children that had had malaria attacks in in the control group and determine if malaria actually did decrease in the program group as a result of the program. Again, with asymptomatic malaria parasites, reduced anemia, 
increased school attendance, improved cognition. All of these things can be measured both in the program group and in the control group to determine if the program actually caused these outcomes. So the second, some, some of the things are, are better tested with factual analysis. And by that, I mean that it's, it's not occurring in the control group, so you can't test it in the control group. So most of these things are going to be around how the program actually functions. So the, the assumption that students are correctly targeted is, an, is something that can really only be tested in the program group because it's not happening in the control group. Same with um, the, that children adhere to the full medication regimen. That's that can only be tested in the program group. It's not happening in the control group. So, so it's really a matter of going in. And a lot of these things are, are very well tested with um, a qualitative analysis. So the, bind, the, the question about if this is actually the binding constraint, so why are children not in school in the first place, would, would be very, very well tested with a qualitative analysis to go talk to parents and ask them why their child is not in school. And then some outcomes and assumptions just can't be measured. And that's okay. That does not mean that it should not go into your theory of change. That means it should definitely go into your, into your theory of change. And you should recognize that it's an unmeasurable or untestable assumption. So the first thing is that the medicine is effective. So like I said, hopefully the Kenyan government has selected a, a medicine that was proven to be very, very effective in clinical trials. But in the context of the evaluation that, that we've constructed, it's not a testable assumption. And then I actually added one link in the causal chain, and that is that increased um, knowledge actually leads to higher test scores. And the assumption behind that is that tests actu accurately measure knowledge. So anytime that you have a proxy indicator for what you actually want to know, so if you want to know if women are empowered, you're going to have a lot of proxy indicators around that, and you have to know that, that there's an assumption that that proxy indicator is actually an accurate measure of, your, um, of the outcome that you really want to see. Um, there are some criticisms of the theory of change, but I think I'm running out of time. Um, so I will just basically set you up for some questions that you can ask me at the end. Um, so, so one is that, that a theory of change oversimplifies the program, um, and I would say that that's not necessarily the case. The second is that long-term effects are not considered. Again, not necessarily the case. They, you can definitely consider them. Um, that unintended consequences are not considered. Um, that it does not consider that the program and out, program to outcomes is unidirectional. So you might actually have some feedback happening. Um, and that heterogeneous effects are not considered. So all of these are criticisms that I've heard of the theory of change that I would say are actually not um, valid criticisms because they can definitely be incorporated into your theory of change. It's a matter of how large you want to make it. So I will show the the um, argument against the fact that they're oversimplified. So this is um, a theory of change that was actually put together by Catalyst Management Services, who's here today, um, for a program that they're evaluating on early child marriage, or on early marriage, um, that requires a lot of behavior change. So anytime that you have a program that requires a lot of behavior change, your theory of change is necessarily going to be longer because there are many more assumptions um, that go from they actually receive information to they actually change their behaviors. <coughs> okay, so the next that I, next thing I wanted to talk about is timing. So when what is the best time to actually construct a theory of change? And I think the best time is during the program design. So the breakthrough example that I showed, the early marriage um, campaign that I that I showed was actually constructed while the program was being designed. And I think that that was really, really useful for the program team as well as for the evaluation team. Um, if that's not possible, if you're thrown into an evaluation where you had nothing to do with the program design, then you should definitely construct a theory of change before you collect data. Because the theory of change should very much influence the way that your, um, that your survey instrument is designed. And if that's not possible, if you are given a data set to analyze, then you should definitely construct a theory of change before you start analyzing any data, because it should really inform what assumptions you have about how the program functioned, and you can make them into testable hypotheses. So I would say that that should definitely be in place. 
So these are kind of my closing remarks, which are not necessarily a summary, but um, as I said at the beginning, the ultimate goal is to answer the why question. So why did the program work? Why did the program not work? And hopefully to go a step further and say, how could it be improved? That it identifies assumptions and creates testable hypotheses. That it identifies areas of potential weakness in the program. So again, so, so that at the end, you're not just saying to the, to the implementing agency, your program worked well or your program didn't work, but I can't tell you how to improve it. It's, it's good to be useful to the implementing agency at the end of that. And then um, the theory of change can be created for new and existing programs. So the fact that you're not there from the beginning doesn't mean that you shouldn't create a theory of change. Thanks, Lindsay, for outlining the basic concepts uh, and steps involved in designing a theory of change and its application. And thank you also for summing up the frequent criticisms of the theory of change. Um, it would have been nice if we had more time to actually hear how those could be addressed. Um, but I'll now turn to the audience, and uh, in case you have certain questions or comments, we'll take um, three questions in one go, and then Lindsay will answer um, simultaneously. Yes, you and then you, please. Uh, could the mics be given to them, please? I congratulate you for a nice I congratulate for a nice presentation. I just want to know that when you say that counterfact in the uh, example you have given and you are using the counterfactual, how will you reconcile with the ethical issues? Can you just pass the mic to the gentleman please? Hello, uh, this is Manish from Impact. Uh, I just wanted to know, when you're presenting your theory of change, you said that there is a whole lot of outcomes that need to be achieved, uh, assuming that there are a, lot, a whole lot of assumptions uh, that will hold true. Now, when we actually put this whole thing into practice, a uh, lot of these outcomes improve, and some don't improve, and in different variations. And same is the case with assumptions that you know some holds true, some don't hold true, and to some variations and all. And eventually, we are trying to answer th again the same question: did, did the knowledge increase, for example, in your? How do you actually demystify the whole thing and say you know which uh, assumption hold held true? And you know when we are trying to get down to that answer, why? So again, you are left with the two broad things that you know these outcomes happened and these assumptions did not hold true. But Again, those are broad sets and not coming down to the specifics of why. So how do you demystify that in theory of change? One more Hi, I'm uh, Vanita Mukherjee. And my question is on the whole uh, issue of oversimplifying, oversimplification of the theory of change versus the creating a complex model. And my question is, when you have a complex model, because I know that breakthrough program, how do you, what are the pitfalls in terms of tracking? Because you have a whole lot of elements coming into the model, vis-a-vis -vis the one that you presented, which is very simple, I mean relatively simple. So how do you deal with that when you have a complex model? So, I should take <coughs> so I'll, I'll start with the question about how do you actually figure out if all of these assumptions and the links that you've put into the chain into the theory of change um, occur. So I tried to touch on it a bit when I talked about measuring outcomes through a counterfactual, a factual, or a factual analysis, or just realizing that some things you can't actually test. So um, hopefully, in in the evaluation. It's going to come more through the evaluation tools that you use. So I come more from an impact evaluation background, which is um, a lot of qualitative and quantitative mixed, but I would say, I guess, a bit heavier on the quantitative. Um, so you actually test with survey instruments, but, but this, this theory should, should inform what questions you're asking. And then at the end, if you find out that, yes, malaria did, did go down 
substantially in the program group, but the test scores still didn't increase, then it's something in between those two outcomes. So it, it must have been that the children actually... Hold the mic. Oh. It must have been that maybe the children didn't end up going to school more, or maybe the children weren't concentrated. Um, but if you find out that they are more concentrated and they were attending school, but their learning still didn't increase, then you know it must be something between that, which is one of the assumptions is that is that the schools are functioning sufficiently well. So if they still haven't learned anything, but they're in school and they're they're concentrated and they have improved cognition, then it's it's most likely the schools. So I, it it allows you to actually um, figure out where the program broke down if it did break down. And like you said, you could actually find that school. Um, achievement actually does increase, but some of the other assumptions didn't hold. But that just means if you actually tweak that, if you tweak the program and you make that assumption hold, that the program is going to perform even better than it was before. By the way, what happens if malaria uh, doesn't reduce, right. but the education, uh, like uh, the knowledge scores do increase? What happens then? That would be difficult to explain, <laughs> I think. I mean, yeah, I, I guess you would have to step back and think about your theory of change again. And, and try to figure out. So I, th I think that um, if you've designed your evaluation in such a way, you should be able to figure out why. I mean, if there was some external factor that happened, maybe educational outcomes increased all over Kenya, um, and you weren't able to control for that, um, depending on your evaluation methodology. So, um, The second is that you asked about ethical issues with the counterfactual, and I think that that's a little bit outside of the, of the context of today, um, just because <coughs> I, yeah, I think that a control group, um, yeah, could be a very long discussion. But at least for me, I think that there's all there are always going to pe be people that don't receive a program, and so you have to figure out who that is. And so um, I think that if you can if you can decide who that is in such a way that helps your meth your your um, evaluation design and hopefully isn't unethical, then that's a good thing. So um, there was one other question about the complex model. So I think that yes, you can definitely make the model as big as you want to, you can make it as long as you want to, you can think about 25 year outcomes and just realize that you may not be able to test all of those things, you might not be able to test all of those assumptions or all of those outcomes that you want to see 25 years down the line, but I would say that that's much more a constraint to your evaluation design or your, your evaluation timeline than it is a constraint to the theory of change. The theory of change you can put down on paper anything that you want to and, and any, any way that you think the program could go, but you might not be able to test all of those things. And like I said, knowing that there's an assumption or knowing that there's something that you want to see really far down the line and not being able to test it is not ideal, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't write it down, that you shouldn't realize that it's an assumption. So. Sorry, we're out of time for questions. Uh, we're going to move to our second presentation. Uh, thanks, Lindsay, for uh, explaining the brass stacks of the theory of change. Our second presentation will deal with a more complex case study from the education sector on shaping program and evaluation design. I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker, Vimla Ramachandran, who's the Managing Director of the Educational Resource Unit. Vimla Ramachandran has worked on education, public health, and child development for over 25 years and has extensive experience in policy and program development, evaluation, and qualitative research. She was the first National Project Director of Mahila Samakya, a founder trustee of Health Watch, a network of social activists and researchers working on women's health issues. Thank you. I'm going to talk a bit about Sarva Shiksha Abhyan. And before I start, I'd like to say it's a universal program, so you cannot find a control group anywhere in the country. Uh, and Sarva Shiksha Abhyan is really the All India it's an education for all program and it really came immediately after district primary education program and this is also jointly funded by several donors at the moment I think it's World Bank and DFID but at different points of time EU, UNICEF etc were also involved okay. the goals of SSA I'm not going to go on and I'm not going to read out but basically the goals of SSA is for universal elementary education that all children are in school and they're learning and they're, the transition rates increase and their learning levels go up and they're able to complete the eight year cycle immediately after very recently in 2009 the right to education was brought in which was in 2009 
and it was an overarching legislation which again there is no control group anywhere in india it it harmonizes immediately after the rte the there was an effort to harmonize the sarva shiksha abhiyan with the provisions of the right to education act and therefore broadly uh, certain norms were set with re respect to neighborhood schools infrastructure and teacher related so therefore you have these two programs which is quite overarching uh if you ask me whether it's built on a theory of change i really do not know because at, as far as i am concerned or as far as the government is concerned they were actually looking for certain goals to be reached so i don't think there was any theory of change which was built into the program essentially what the government was looking for is that all children in the age group of 6 to 14 are enrolled in school and are completing 8 years of elementary education <clears throat> there were also some very clear outcome targets which were set in 2001 and later on they've been revised but broadly the uh, the outcome targets are uh, had to do with enrollment it has to do with attendance it has to do with pass percentages and it has to do with the reduction in the out uh, number of out of school children <clears throat> now uh, because this forum is about theory of change there is a uh, agreeing that it is not built on a theory of change but it may be worthwhile to ask as to what are the intermediary outcomes and i think that the goals that the government set are really those kind of intermediary outcomes because ultimate outcome for the right to education is that all children have access to good quality education which means all children are learning <clears throat> yet if you look at the situation today a very large number of children are enrolled in primary a little less in upper primary and when you go to the secondary level that's even less so it's not as if that for every 100 children who who actually enter primary school maybe a certain percentage may finish primary maybe as close to 86 87% but when you look at secondary education it is shocking at 27% that is only entering secondary school dropout rates have not reduced and in fact dropout rates remain extremely high when it comes to scheduled caste when it comes to scheduled tribe children muslims and among all these communities the dropout rates at least till recently was higher for girls the trend seems to have reversed in the last two data sets that i seem to have seen furthermore the asar which many of you are familiar with reveals that over 50% of children in grade 5 can barely read a grade 2 text so if this is a program then how are we going to go ahead evaluating it i'm just going to take you through some data which you want you can take it from them here look at the dropout rates for scheduled caste girls it is still around 62% and i am told even today that is in 2011 data that we have is around 59% so it essentially means that over 60% of scheduled tribe girls who enter grade 1 drop out before they finish grade 8 so the, what are the big unanswered questions despite enhanced input by the government dropout rates continue to be unacceptably high especially among the most deprived and why are learning levels so low despite 20 years of investment in teacher training in new pedagogies in cluster and block level academic support and monitoring systems obviously something is really really wrong there is a huge gap in the knowledge as to we we know things are happening but we're not able to answer the question why they are happening <clears throat> i want to talk a bit about the joint review mission <clears throat> mechanism of government of india and the donors and this joint review mission mechanism has been in operation since 1994 firstly with the dpp project and now with ssa and the joint review mission routinely actually reviews a lot of the quantitative data which comes in every year every, every six months in fact quantitative data is presented but over the last five or six years there have been very serious questions being asked as to yes we know in some parameters there are improvements while in other parameters there are no improvements at all and what is the why as lindsay was saying but the kind of methodology that the government uses in the jrm does not help us really understand why so as a result what did the government do around 
six or so, they decided to commission a range of studies to understand the why. And we are doing one of the studies, so therefore I wanted to share part of that. Some very concrete, tangible issues like teacher attendance and time on task. This was jointly done by the government and the World Bank. There was a study on student attendance done by NCERT. There was also a study done on the number of days that schools actually work. And there are some not so tangible studies which were done. One was on community oversight and functioning of the village education committees and the school development and management committees, SDMC. I'm sorry, that's a mistake there. And of course, there is a one study in which I'm the principal investigator. It's called Inclusion and Exclusion and Discrimination Inside the School and Inside the Classroom. Maybe these kind of studies was an acknowledgement that there are certain other intermediary factors which needs to be inquired into if you want to understand why learning is not happening and why dropout rates continue to be low. Inclusion study objectives are quite significant. These objectives were drafted by the government and given to us. They wanted to know the nature of participation of students from diverse social groups. They wanted to identify practices, behaviors in different spheres of school, like midday meal, drinking water, use of toilets, assembly, sacred spaces, if any. In many schools, we found sacred spaces being maintained in the school. Then classroom, class teaching and learning, corporal punishment, verbal, physical abuse, extra encouragement versus neglect, and of course, extracurricular activities like morning assembly, special functions of the school, games and sports. And of course, to gather, gather the parents' view on the prevalence of inclusive or inclusion or exclusive practices in the school. <laughs> Why? The hypothesis was that children may not be learning or dropping out because exclusion and discrimination in school leads to poor self-image of children. And this poor self-image can lead to dropout. This poor self-image can lead to children not paying much attention in class. So, therefore, exclusion of any kind can actually lead to higher dropout rates or non-learning. <clears throat> the second hypothesis that we were trying to explore is that teacher attitudes towards children vary from very from especially from very poor and socially disadvantaged group makes a big difference for example ignoring them in class making derogatory remarks not being empathetic to their predicament could actually lead to the children dropping out or just not participating in school and of course corporal punishment and verbal abuse may also be linked to social identity and gender so these are the kind of reasons, this was the hypothesis which, was, which we tried to formulate, saying that among the reasons, it's not the only reason, there are a wide range of reasons why children do not learn in school or, or drop out from school. It could have to do with teacher attendance, which was another study. It had to do with, could, have, could have actually had to do with actual teaching time, time on task, and it also could do with discrimination. But interestingly, these where different studies are done in sort of silos. Each study is being done by a different group of people and hopefully the joint review mission mechanism will be able to put it all together and try to understand why this is happening. Now methodology was a big challenge for a study like this because it's purely qualitative in nature. It's very difficult for us to give a questionnaire and ask children, are you being discriminated against? Or ask the teachers if you're discriminating against children. So therefore it has to be a kind of... Uh, we have to use an ethnographic and observation kind of tools in order to get to the heart of the problem. So therefore, in addition to gathering on-site data on enrollment, infrastructure, pupil-teacher ratios, etc., which is, gives you the backdrop, what the study tried to do is observe teaching learning processes in class, teacher-pupil interactions, peer interaction among students and among teachers. <coughs> And of course, we looked at access to facilities like drinking water, sanitation. As you know, in India, one of the biggest markers of exclusion and discrimination is preventing access to drinking water, preventing access to certain kinds of facilities which other children may have. And also, we also try to look at the allocation of duties to children. Morning assembly, extracurricular activities, sweeping, cleaning rooms, cleaning toilets, other chores in the classroom or chores for teachers. 
structured activities with children in classes 4 to 7 to understand their experience of schooling this is a kind of tool which ERU over the years have actually we have developed this tool of gathering data through with children by a range of structured activities and we have used it in several qualitative studies then of course semi structured interviews with teachers and administrators focus group discussions with parents especially from the most deprived social group in the village and also with the village education committee and the SDMC and we also did a focus group discussion with adolescent boys and girls separately who graduated from the school or maybe studying in a secondary school or who had dropped out <coughs> the coverage of this study is Bihar, Orissa, Assam, Rajasthan, Andhra Pradesh and Madhya Pradesh and what we did was we looked at 20 schools per districts and each of the states we asked them to take two districts but Madhya Pradesh went ahead and took four districts okay and then even the school selection was done close to the main road at a distance from the main road and remote areas so this is the methodology we used we are still analyzing the data but essentially what I wanted to present here was that to find out why children are learning or not learning and why children are dropping out is much more complex than just the input indicators which we all seem to be able to get a handle on. But the non-tangible or intangible aspects of education in terms of teacher-pupil relationships, teacher-pupil interaction is very, very important because that is what really marks out a bad school from a quote-unquote a good school. And I'll give you some preliminary findings. We're still working on the report. But we found that caste, in fact, the most marginalized children in the village are in government schools. We found very few extremely forward caste children in government schools. It was either SC, ST, Muslim and OBC. We found very few forward caste children in most of the sample schools, except in one or two, one or two you would find. Caste is an important ma marker. In fact, it's a more important marker than gender we found. Sweeping and cleaning toilets are done by children only of a particular caste. All children don't do it. Handling drinking water or any other water source is also marked by caste. Midday meal, it's not discrimination among children, but who cooks? So there's been a lot of debates even in, the, in our sample villages as to who is appointed as a cook. So even in Madhya, Madhya Pradesh where scheduled caste, self-help groups are given the Given the contract to provide the midday meal, all of them have appointed an OBC person as a cook. Students do not mix freely and social norms in the village are followed in the school. And same with teachers. Among teachers we found gender segregation is evident. But we also found, in fact in all the six states, a highly motivated committed headmaster can neutralize social norms and promote equality. We found that in every single state, even though we didn't go looking for it from our sample, which clearly shows that if we look hard and if we, if we try and look at what these headmasters are doing, maybe it will be possible for us to neutralize some of these things in class. Uh, teacher attitudes and practices were also fairly significant. Bright children were always sitting on the front row and those who are neat and clean. Children who are not neat and clean and dirty were relegated to the back of the room. All classrooms had a group of silent, passive children, teacher, and teachers paid very little attention to them. They were the ones who were absent often, and teachers did not take any interest in them. In some states, teachers routinely used caste names to call out or disability markers. Like Langada, Lula is very common that the teachers use these kind of words. And hygiene and appearance seems to be very important and we found that teachers were not touching the books of some children. They asked them to keep it there and they used to look at it like that and sign. And after class 3 or 4, gender is also very pronounced. They sit in separate rows. Women teachers do not mix with male teachers, etc. I think my time is up. But essentially what uh, we learned was that today in the government school system, there is no detention policy. So children are promoted from grade 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 and now they will be promoted to grade 8 under RTE. So because there is no detention, we found that teachers are also lax and there is no learning happening. And this could also be one of the reasons. 
and teachers are not worried about learning because in in the teacher interviews we we've, we've got records of interviews saying these people are not interested in education the home environment is like that so how do you expect them to learn but the overwhelming message from this study was a good school leader can prevent exclusionary practices and foster learning and ensure all children get attention that they need exclusion does make a difference to participation and can push children out of school this is what our study found but still preliminary stages we are still analyzing the data and putting it together i've done one round of qualitative data analysis and doing the second round trying to go a little deeper thank you very much I know work on the Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan and highlighting the importance of having a clearly thought out theory of change one that moves beyond linear causation you know understands more complex relationships and goes beyond a simple framework of just inputs and tangible outputs accounts for different needs risks and trajectories of various social groups uh, such as minorities girls scheduled castes and scheduled tribes um i'd like to open the floor to questions we will take three questions and then um vimla ramachandran will answer them please raise your hands please one two shobini jepal so it seems from your presentation that uh, there's only there's my biggest take away i think from this is that it seems that the headmasters clearly have a theory of change or what they expect to see at their schools but the governments who are actually scripting uh, what should happen in the school or in, and in the education system I do not really have a very clear theory of change i think this is more like a comment than a uh, than a question uh, hello i am namrita from priya uh, thank you ma'am it was a very fascinating presentation what was interesting is it actually combines um, in say your presentation and uh, vimla ji yours that uh, what do you do when you go for an evaluation and there is no clear cut you know theory of change already uh, on board so do you kind of try re- reconstructing it and what how do you reconstruct it when it's a big program like this which has already been developed so what are the challenges or do you kind of so um, how do you operate around that so like you said you should do it before data collection or before data analysis so how does how do these two things merge if you have to really try you know addressing the why or is it possible to do it without really terming it as a theory of change assessment so we have a third question could you please pass the mic yeah. satoko kamoto from institute of rural research and development could you explain the process through which you came up with a two hypotheses pardon two hy- the, could you explain the processes that you came up with the hypotheses that your researchers studied <coughs> just taking three questions for now the first one wasn't a question so you can take one more than i can okay uh ramita <coughs> i honestly don't know uh how one can adapt the theory of change for me also it's a learning process because when uh, jpal asked me and i said you know i'm quite clueless about theory of change except having read about it then so therefore well, i think i would imagine you need to look at what leads to what a kind of a causal both linear as well as not so linear causal diagram we need to make or some kind of linkages and then move on so i'm not the right person to answer that question on theory of change i really try to fit what we are doing into that whole kind of lingo uh the hypothesis actually was developed in the during the course of the discussion for instance when the study was commissioned we had a whole uh, series of meetings where we looked at existing secondary literature on exclusion inclusion and dropout rates and there were a lot of uh, evidence that people were alluding to discrimination and exclusion in the classroom as being an important issue especially the studies done on dalits and on tribal uh, communities and recent studies on muslim uh, communities actually pointed to prevalence of discrimination and exclusion and we built our hypothesis based on the review of secondary literature 
if, uh, once the report is out, I would imagine that we will share some of the review of the secondary literature also. I don't think I need to comment on uh, Chauvinis because I agree with you that the people who have an idea, a strategy for change is really the headmasters or it could also be a block, block level functionary. So they must have some idea of what can bring about change. And if they have that idea, then they can go about realizing that idea. But unfortunately, in large government programs, it's not about a theory of change. It's about achieving certain goals. And when those goals are not achieved, they, it's a question about sincerely I'm, uh, to talk about why they're not been achieved. And then you go on to more and more studies. Because even under DPP, I remember among the first studies which was commissioned was looking at gender and social equity, how it plays itself out within the schooling system. There were also studies specifically on the situation of Dalits and specially, uh, specifically on the situation of tribals. But today, uh, Sarve Shiksha Abhyan went a step further and said, I don't think we, need, we know a lot about that. We know who is going, who is not going, but we need to understand why. And I think that's why they decided to commission some more studies. But they're all silos in silos. Um, we'll take one one more question here, front, please. Well, I just wanted to, you know, sh t tell you something which I found very strange. I've known you from the days of Mahila Samakya mm -hmm. and you've seen that when the large program as large as Mahila Samakya was introduced, we did discover that the change was there. You, we have all been admitting it. As far as the right to education is concerned, I was quite amazed to find that you feel that it cannot be you know, related to any change. No, no, I, I didn't mean that. <laughs> no, I, I I, the impression wrong. that I got was that you said that change, I really do not know whether it would bring or not. Let me share it with this house that the government of India has been working on various projects at the national level, at the district levels, at the state levels, which have been responsible for making changes which are noticeable in the schools and in homes as well. The NCERT has conducted four evaluation studies with the support of the TCFTSA and all through these studies we did find that the quality initiatives did make a difference, which means that a positive change was noticed. Another thing which I would like to share with you is that one finds it very difficult to accept that the dropout rate is as high as you have reported. Uh, what was the source? I was really yeah, curious to. Should I just answer? And yeah. Thank you. I think you misunderstood. I didn't mean change will not happen. I was talking about the theory of change which we're talking about here. So please, there's a misunderstanding there. The data is this, uh, the government's SES, Select Education Statistics of Government of India. I have not used any other data. Okay, we're out of time unfortunately. We have to move to our uh, next presentation. Our third speaker is Dr. Priya Nanda, Director of the Social and Economic Development Group for the International Center for Research on Women at the Asia Regional Office in Delhi. Dr. Nanda oversees research, policy, and programmatic work on issues related to gender equality and poverty reduction with a focus on the intersections between economic and health issues. Her work includes research, measurement, and evaluation of women's economic empowerment and access to health services, including reproductive health and HIV. In her presentation, oh, she will give us an illustration of the underlying complexities um, in, applying the eva in applying the theory of change to the eval evaluation of the Apni Beti Apna Dhan program, which is a conditional cash transfer scheme to improve the status of girls in Haryana, one of the states with the lowest sex ratios in India. Thanks, Thank Priya. you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Um, 
it's really actually very convenient and good that I'm going last because it's a really nice segue from what's been stated. I was asked to come and present on our evaluation that ICRW is doing on a conditional cash transfer program of the government of Haryana that was initiated in 1994. And we are conducting the evaluation now in 2012. And uh, we are at the stage where we are do we've just finished our formative research and we are now developing our surveys and going to soon be implementing our uh, actual impact evaluation study by the summer of 2012. So I'm really talking about uh, the theory of change that we are discovering and discerning as we are doing the formative research for the study. Uh, very briefly, I'll talk about the program and its specifics. Sorry, the program and its specifics. Uh, talk about the theory of change, ostensible, articulated, unarticulated aspects of the theory of change of the program. Our research and our methodology. The construct of values, because what we are really trying to associate is, does this program really enhance values? And I'll get into that in a few minutes. And then lastly, relate, go back and bring a closure to this whole idea of the outcome of value and what the scheme or the program intended to do. So I'll spend a few minutes on this slide. This is really my program. What is the program doing and what does it entail uh, slide? If you look at the left hand side, these are the different implementation aspects of the program. Uh, what's important to note here is that it is one of the first uh, conditional cash transfer programs on the value of girls in India. It has been implemented by the government of Haryana from the, between the years of 1994 and 1998. And it's implemented through the ICDS uh, program through the Department of Women and Child Development in the state government of Haryana. The context in Haryana, as has been mentioned at that time when the program was first designed and implemented, one was one of highly adverse uh, sex ratios at birth. In 1991, which is just prior, the census that uh, took these measurements prior to when the scheme was developed, the sex ratio at birth was 865, uh, which is 865 girls to 1,000 surviving boys. And um, just very briefly, uh, I'll get into the details again. is born, a certain amount of money, which is 2,500 rupees, is deposited in her name in a bond, which will mature to 25,000 rupees when she's 18. And the condition is that if she is still unmarried at 18, she can encash that bond. And she would get approximately 25,000 rupees, depending on whether the principal was invested exactly at the time of her birth or a few months after her birth. And what is the desired impact? Um, We'll discuss this even more in detail as we talk about the theory of change. If you read the intentionality of the government, as you read the documents of the program, what you, the language that is uh, stated is that it is really, in, uh, it is really to address the concern of declining sex ratio at birth in Haryana, and the 